my theory about why Jewish people speak with the ch sounds that we do. Yeah. It's not because of any fancy linguistic development particularly, it's because the Jews are a dairy-eating people. <laughs> and we talk this way because we have to. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Dairy <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, if you think about it, about all the peoples in the world that have that ch sound, they eat a lot of dairy. And people like the Chinese, they don't eat dairy, they don't say ch. You have to clear your throat all the time if you eat a lot of dairy. That's all there is to it. This is chokhmah. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. I'm sticking to okay. it. I would stick with, st with, with this story with you too. Okay. My name is Laurie Cahan Simon. I was born Cahan. I added the Simon when I got married. Go figure. All right. So, uh, so how did you come to Yiddish? Well, that's an interesting story, I think. Um, let's see. I was in Cleveland, and my good friend Norman Tischler knew this guy, Mel Arnoff, who was in charge of the Schule at the Cleveland Abitering. And uh, Mel said to Norman, I need a drama teacher, and I need an art teacher for my Schule. Do you know people that I can hire? He says, I know just the person. You see, so it was me, and he interviewed. So I took the art drop job and the drama job, mm -hmm. and they made it into one job. So I was there for about a year, and I was teaching drama, and I would write the plays, and I said, well, I guess I should be sticking some Yiddish in here, and uh, how do I do that? I, how do you say good morning? How do you say how are you? I'm going to see the rabbi, you know, things like this. I was writing plays. And so I would have a sprinkling of Yiddish and uh, direct the kids and we'd put on the plays and they were great fun and then I would make art projects and I would have to research are there any Yiddish art forms that I can teach them, etc. And after a year, Mel said, um, I'm now becoming the director of the Workman Circle, so you are now the music teacher because he knew I could sing and I've been sitting in on the music classes all year and becoming familiar with it. And so he and I sat down one summer day and with the tape recorder and he played all the songs, sang all the songs, gave me the tape and the book, here now you learn it. Oh nice. My grandparents had spoke had spoken Yiddish, but do you think I ever heard Ein Wort? No. I didn't know they spoke Yiddish. Did you hear the songs? No. Not even the songs. No, nothing. My grandmother, my father's mother, apparently uh, was a beautiful singer and played fabulous piano, was implored at every party to sing Shane Vidi Lavona. I never heard it. She never, she knew I loved to sing. She never bothered to teach me anything. That's why my, my series of holiday songs is called Songs My Puppy Should Have Taught Me because she didn't. And I'm still pissed. Can I say that? You can say pissed. Okay. Can, can she say pissed? Can I say it? All right, I, I just did. Pissed. I just did. So, uh, I mean, as long as you're saying pitched. Uh, let me say I resent it. I resent it. But, I mean, because who knows what I might have learned. But I have to say that even though I didn't learn the language, I know that because I learned to sing from my father, who was a lay rabbi, and we used to go to shul every Friday night, and he did a fabulous service with the old chazonis. And he was also the chazan. So he was the rabbi and he was the chazan. And I sang with him a lot, and I learned those tunes. And so even though I didn't learn the words, I learned the tom, because he learned from his mother to sing. And I'm sure she learned from her mother, and who knows how far back. Okay, so wait a minute. You just said your, your dad was a rabbi. Mm hmm And you didn't learn Yiddish from him? No. Did you learn Hebrew? Sort of, yeah. So did you, did you have a bat mitzvah? Yeah. I was one of those first girls to have a bat mitzvah in the 60s. Nice. Yeah. Conservative shul. Oh, never. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so when you brought Yiddish, you know, into the art, first in the art and then the songs, Oh, oh yeah, I'll get back to that story. How was it? How was it received by the kid? I'm curious by the kids, but also by the parents. Well, it was a Yiddish shule, so the songs I was learning were all Yiddish lido. Uh -huh. So I, I came to the school. Okay, I learned the songs over the summer, but I, unless the translation was right there, I didn't know what they meant. So I made the Yiddish teacher sit in the classes so that if there was something I didn't know, I would say. What does this mean? Mm -hmm. And very, very shortly, I said to myself, this can't go on. And so I started to learn Yiddish and self-defense. And how exactly did you learn? 
Weinreich. College Lieder. Yiddish. College Yiddish. Well, yeah. more like the dictionary. Oh, the, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I had, I had uh, cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. uh, CDs weren't really yeah. as popular then. And I, I got songbooks and I ordered songbooks. So I had the dictionary and I had songbooks and I had things to listen to. And I started listening to everything I could, spoken word and songs. And uh, because I was starting teaching the kinder, I was starting with the most basic things. Mm -hmm. So I was learning two steps ahead of them, or maybe even one. Nice. You know, I would, I would figure out a song that I was going to teach them. I would maybe go over five songs in a week and um, be able to explain them to them and any relevant grammar points I would try to instill in them. And, uh, and, th and that's how it went. So my Yiddish is far from complete, uh, far from fluent. And as I was telling Sheva earlier today, when I'm with somebody who's a lot better than I am, I feel really intimidated. In the oh, well, relax. Don't them. worry. I won't intimidate because, you. Because I'm the kind of person I like to be perfect. And if I'm not perfect, I feel imperfect, which is not good for me. <laughs> so I, I'm okay with somebody who's worse than I am. And then I actually speak better than I, I normally do. Do you remember the first song you learned? The first song I learned. The first song you learned so you could teach? <clears throat> well, I mean, I listened for a year. So I was familiar with a lot of them. So you didn't have to make a conscious choice, this is going to be the song I do for your first one with them, with the kids? Well, I don't know, it might have been something like, Good morning, night, good morning, night, good morning, Alamein, good morning, night. You repeat that. Ah, good morning, good morning, Alamein, ah, good morning. Good morning, alle men. Good morning, Nike. Good morning, Nike. Good morning, alle men. Good morning, Nike. And it's a tune that if anyone ever went to Hebrew school, they know that tune from Shabbat Shalom. And uh, it has the Yiddish Werte. Uh, and it's easy, it's repetitive, just what kids need. Mm -hmm. And uh, so That's that would be probably the first one. You sing beautifully. Oh, thank you. So, so what are your, some of your favorites? So, what are the ones that you were like most proud of, like bringing to the kids? Oh gosh. Well, my favorites, personally, yeah, is stuff that I have to really dig hard to find. For me, the treasure hunt is the excitement in that. Go, finding in some obscure collection, somebody's library, or some library in an odd part of the world. They have a book that I've never heard of, and I get a copy of it by hook or by crook, and look at it, and it's filled with amazing things, like that song, Die Vivaque, mm -hmm. that I sang, Riva uh, Voyalske, most people don't know. I've never heard of it. And just charming, the whole book, Molochein. And I take my computer and my music writing program, and I transcribe it from the book into the computer with the lyrics and everything. So I can print them out for the. <coughs> <coughs> so I can print them out for the children, and we have a, a book of stuff. And uh, so I was teaching this, and a girl said to me, "My mom sings this oh. as a lullaby." So can you give some examples of like your favorite treasure hunts? Mm. Well, it also has to do with with people, because. One thing I do with my recordings is not just put a title, not just maybe put a few uh, a, a translation, but I give the transliteration. I wish I could put the Yiddish Oasis, but that'll have to come for some future project. But I also think it's important to know the history of the song, if you can find it out. Put something about the biography of the composer, of the author. If there's a dance that goes with a song, put instructions for the dance if you can find it. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's this kind of thing. If a song is listed in um, one book as having an unknown composer or author, is that so? Can I find it through my knowledge already of what's the style of this composer or that poet? Can I figure out, is there a stylistic relation? that I can make an educated guess and find some source? 
for example, in the um, Hebrew University series, a um, anthology of Yiddish folk song. Are you familiar with the big red books? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. It was four, and then they they put one out on Gibiotik, and maybe Valshavsky, and then something else too. Mm. So. It's grown, but there, there were four books to begin with, and they were separated as to uh, like work songs, wedding and holiday songs, love songs, children's songs, like that. And um, <clears throat> I looked at this one song, a sukkah lead. Uh, which one was? A sukke a kleine von Brettlach gemeine hab ich kein Mitzuris gemacht. Gedeckt den Dach mit a bissel es krach und in ich sitz in im Sukkes bei Nacht. Like that. Beautiful. And it was attributed to Golub. Well, I had sheet music of the same song from Golub. And it was a different melody. I'm saying to myself, he's not going to write two melodies for the same song. It's just not going to happen. You write it, you go on to another song. You're not going to go back. So I said, this can't be by Gallup. And I started looking in other sources. And a one thing I do, if I have a book and has a bibliography, I'll go look in the bibliography and see if there's anything applicable to my work, whether it might have Kinderlieder or Jantoflieder. And I'll see if I can find a copy of it somewhere. I'll look in WorldCat, see if it's anybody's holdings, see if I can get somebody to either lend a copy or photocopy it for me, or uh, maybe they know of some individual who is holding this, or I'll ask my friends with involved in libraries like Bob Friedman in Philadelphia, who has the uh, the archive of Yiddish music, that um, <coughs> he's made a. a a wonderful resource online listing everything that you could possibly want to know about it. And that's also linked with the Florida Atlantic University Judaica um, archive, which has the sound recordings. And so they're linked with each other. Mm -hmm. And Bob is an incredible, lovely, generous, with his information and himself, person. And every time I've ever asked him something, he's been able to help me find an answer or a resource, a source for the printed music, or uh, made me a copy of something I can listen to that isn't available anywhere. Um, that's part of the fun of the treasure hunt, moving on. So in the bibliography, I'll look, and maybe the next book I get has another bibliography, and it has resources that I hadn't seen before. So I went along this way for a while, and I found reference to Yola Engel, who was part of the uh, St. Petersburg um, Folk, Jewish Folk Music Society, something like that, um, around the turn of the 20th century. And I found people who had various copies of different, well, books or folios, sheet music, Xeroxes of things, and in looking through all that stuff, I finally found that it was Yol Engel who wrote the music to that Asuka Ekleine. Mm -hmm. So, and then I, I found that there were other things in error in that series too. And another song that was Yol Engel as well. So I guess they just didn't like <laughs> <laughs> Yol Engel, I don't know. But, or um, they didn't have a researcher like you. Yeah, but that's one thing that I really enjoy finding out. There was a, a friend of mine up at the Bialik School in in Toronto, and they were putting together a CD of Kinderlieder for the Yiddish students, and she asked me if I would look it over and help her edit. So in looking at all the songs, I noticed that they were missing all the attributions for composers and authors, and I said, I can do this. And it turned out I found everything by the time of publication except for one or two songs, and then after <laughs> it was published already. Then I, I found the other ones that they were missing. But mm -hmm. this is the way the world goes. They don't put the attributions. Then it's lost. People forget. They don't remember. They don't care. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's important to know. Because a folk song is a folk song for a reason, but it didn't spring up spontaneously like the grass grows up out of the earth because a seed falls. 
Somebody, somewhere, at some point, created this. And who is it? I'd like to know. And a lot of times we can find out just through a little careful looking. Hmm. So I consider that one of my main missions, to be nice. precise, to be thorough, and bring this information to people. So it shouldn't be lost. And in doing so, also I found a lot of verses that people don't sing anymore to a lot of songs. Oh, that's interesting. Why? Because they're lazy. So, so what do you do? What do you do with this information when you get it? Uh, I keep books, uh, binders of them, and also the materials on my computer, and then I produce my CDs. And I have three right now, and I have plans for at least a dozen more, and I need about Oh, probably a quarter million dollars, so if anybody would like to donate, I'm uh, hooked up with the 501c3, and they can donate. Are you? Yeah, yeah. And get a tax write-off, which is very nice. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, but the, the stuff that I have is really worthwhile. If anybody knows any Yiddish songs for Hanukkah, maybe they know Oi Hanukkah, Oi Hanukkah. Maybe they know Ich bin ein kleiner Dreidel. I didn't know there was anything other than Oi Hanukkah. Oi kleiner Lichtelach. I mean, the more involved you are in Yiddish, the more songs you're going to know. But I just recorded this, what does it have, 17 songs on it, all Hanukkah? Well. Uh, and there were at least that many more that I didn't record, because there just wasn't room, and I had to make choices. And one of the songs that's on there is from 1726, from the first book of Yiddish songs that was ever published with notes. Hmm. So that, to me, is a thrill. Who? Who knows this? Who's ever recorded this? Who's even ever played this song at Hanukkah, maybe in a few hundred years? Anybody? Maybe not. And I'm sure this is the first time it's recorded. It has, I think, 12 verses. But, see, there, I only even recorded, I think it was four or five of them. Because otherwise it would have taken up most uh -huh. of the CD. Yeah. And how do you make that much interesting? If it's repetition of the same melody, it's a gorgeous melody. But how do you make that interesting to the listener? If you think about it back in the early 18th century, you wanted a really long song because you had a whole evening to fill up. Right? Also, what are also, you going to do? Also, one of the interesting things I had heard with a lot of classical music as well, the reason you you had many verses and you repeated it, was you would only have certain occasions to hear the song. There were no records, right? There were no discs. Right. So it had to make an impression when you heard it, so you would remember it. That's true. So let me ask you a question, sort of a technical question. So everything you do now is going to CD. Mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about any other sort of business models where you use the internet for, or iTunes um, I, I have my stuff out on there, yeah. Oh, you do? So you're mm -hmm. on iTunes? Mm-hmm. Nice. Good for you. I have a lot of different electronic services that have my stuff for sale, by, either by the song or, or by the album. Uh-huh. And also... Because <coughs> <coughs> it makes it a lot easier to provide the other 12 verses, you know, when you don't have to fit it within a CD. That's true. That's true. So, but I... Honestly, I don't think I'm going to be able to go back and record it. However, I have that information available. It's all transcribed into readable Yiddish. Uh -huh. And I had, oh, wow, to do that, the, um, the, the printing was, well, it was, some people told me it was called Vibataj, some people told me it was something else, some people told me it was a, a variant on the Rashi script. But um, it was really hard to read, and so I had to get experts, like uh, Marian Abtrud, from who's in Germany, the University of Dusseldorf, and uh, my friend Michael Bacherivis helped me, even though he doesn't want me to tell anybody. And uh, <laughs> oh, you can also see it on YiddishLives.com. <laughs> And uh, as many, I, I think I got about four different people to look at this stuff and try and transcribe it to uh, uh, Romanized transliteration for me. Uh, and then, after that was done, we had to try and decipher what do these early 18th century words mean? What is it referring mm. to? 
what is all this stuff? And, and it was really quite a task, and it took many months. But now I have it. And it's really exciting to be the first one in how many hundreds of years to have this at a point where just anybody could appreciate it and maybe sing the song. Actually, they probably couldn't because, I don't know, I think this guy wrote the melody and then wrote all the rest of the lyrics because they don't really fit in with the melody and I had to play quite a lot to shove those words into the... Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so I think he just wrote this he poem and then wrote a melody that this part could fit into and forget about the rest. Uh -huh. But, so it may be singable and it may not, but, <laughs> but at least it's there and it's really interesting. It's the Hanukkah story. It's about the laws of Hanukkah and like how high and how low you're allowed to have the menorah and when you're supposed to be uh, allowed to do this and not that. And, and then the story about, uh, oh, well, I don't, it's disgusting, the story. But... <laughs> I'm going to have to check this out. <laughs> yeah. So, what else? So, that, that kind of research I love to do. So, <clears throat> what do you see in the future for yourself, for your career, for your work? I would like to finish recording all the stuff. I want to finish all the holidays. I want to go back and fill in the ones that I did, wasn't able to record for, for Pesach and Hanukkah. And I also want to record a graded series for children. Take all the easiest songs that I have and put that out for the pre-K and K. Oh, wow. For example. And then the next level may be a tiny bit more difficult. First and second. Third and fourth. Fifth and sixth. And then, you know, then at that point they're a little bit uh, mature enough where they can handle a more adult level of vocabulary and song. But <clears throat> I think this is important to do because most of the material that's out there for Yiddish Kinder, which is very slight, mm -hmm. but most of the stuff that's out is click. <laughs> I hope you are watching, you will produce it. But um, the quality of the instrumentation and the musicianship. Now, divas can eat good hair, and you have dreck gesagt. But really, it's not so, if you have a child and you're playing a, a recording for your child and the child likes it, you're going to hear it until you're about to go out of your mind. So I figured as long as I'm making something for children, it might as well be something that adults are going to enjoy listening to instead of going mishige. So I got the best musicians that I could and they really are the best in the world, in my opinion. Mm -hmm and made wonderful arrangements, things that delighted me. So I figured, if I like it, other people have to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. If they don't all like it, that's on them. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's fun. It's wonderful stuff. Whenever I play it, I see people moving, they want to dance. Whenever I play it for kids, they spontaneously get up and dance. And that makes me really happy. Because if kids are that much into it, they're going to pay attention. If they pay attention, they're going to absorb something. And maybe they're going to absorb more than something. Maybe they're going to be inspired to learn Yiddish and help continue this culture. And after all, that is the main goal that all of us here are after, is the perpetuation, the continuance of the life of Yiddish, not uh, a snapshot of Yiddish, uh, the way it is or was at a certain point, but something that continues to grow and evolve and have a life and something that is then passed down to the next generation as well because it deserves it. Yiddish is an amazing language. I'm the type of crazy person that reads dictionaries uh, in English and other languages. And I have to say that Yiddish is the only language that I've seen that has a specific lexicon that in and of itself is ironic. You use this word and it is something that is ironic as opposed to being told through context, tone. Mm -hmm. And I think that says a lot about the language and the people. And of course when I teach Yiddish it's not Yiddish by itself, it has to be in context because 
a language cannot be divorced from the culture. Whatever language you're teaching, I also teach Spanish. And just to sit there and teach grammar, teach them how to write and teach them how to read something and how to say, hi, my name is, how are you? How old are you? Where do you live? What's your phone number? What does that mean? You have to know something about the culture. Mm -hmm. You have to know something about the music, about the art, something about the food. The food is really important. That's another thing I did at the Abadaring. They didn't have a cooking class. I said, I'm going to teach these kids how to cook Jewish food. Oh, nice. Are you a good Jewish cook? I am. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh. People like my cooking. Oh, I'll be the judge. Good. You're welcome anytime. So, one of the problems that I'm seeing with like Yiddish Lives, this project we're doing, right? Um, so we're taking people, you know, and we're preserving their stories, uh, hopefully for, you know, Eniklich and, you know, right there. But the problem is, the kids have to be able to understand something. They have to want to understand. And then, once they're there, then, here's their grandparents. Here, now they can recapture their family's Yiddish. Mm -hmm. Because so often you skip generation, and then how do right. the kids actually have their right. Yiddish, their family's Yiddish? Um, but that relies on the type of work you're doing. Mm -hmm. So first you actually have the kids wanting to learn Yiddish, wanting to hear Yiddish, or having been exposed in a way it gets them wanting more. So one guy we spoke with recently, Lou Charloff, said that his um, granddaughter came and watched him at a performance, and he's a comedian, and he performed strictly after, on, in Yiddish. <coughs> so he performed entirely in Yiddish, and when he got to the punchline, everyone was laughing and she was laughing. So she came to associate Yiddish with humor mm -hmm. and fun. For me, I came to it through songs. Well, it sounds like the very work you're doing is exactly the same thing. The only reason I speak a word of Yiddish is because of all the joy I had when my family was singing songs. They didn't yeah. speak Yiddish, yeah. my, my Eltel, but they could sing. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're creating this, you know, Meglichkeit, this possibility, this opportunity. I hope so. That's my fervent desire. Nice. That's very noble work. It's fun, too. Yeah. It's... It makes me the happiest of anything to, to sing this stuff. It's says I'm the Okay, I'm sipping over here and I want you I want you to go diva on me. <laughs> Good, go. Hanakis Freilach, Hanakis Freilach, Hanakis Freilach, after ganze Welt, Hanakis Freilach, Hanakis Freilach, Hanakis Freilach, after ganze Welt. Hanneke is vrijelig, Hanneke is schijn. Hanneke is hier aan te vergroeis en verklein. Ach, Hanneke lempel met lichtelig hart. Sint men die lichtelig de nacht nog een nacht. Lichtelig en dreidel en Hanneke geld. Sint jontef bij hier, achter ganse wereld. Hanneke jontef, achter ganse wereld. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Okay, now. I want a modna, something bizarre. Strange. Strange and bizarre. Amai Selen says a big lead with Werther von Bialostotsky and music from Michal Gelbat. In him, Shim Kavokundo, Avokundo, Amlo, Yevokundo, Nevokundo. Das ist doch leise am Meißele, a Ziegele, a Weißele, das Wolken du bist du, a Ziegele, a Weißele, das Wolken du bist du. Von Himmel fällt der Regen du, es macht der Tor sich zu. Yeah, regen du, nicht regen du, das ist doch bloß a Meisele, a Ziegele, a Weisele, das regen du bist du, a Ziegele, a Weisele, das regen du bist du. Er schläft im Feld, a Sangele, a Sangele, Lü, Lü. 
Yes, Angele, Nitz Angele, Dos ist doch heusam, Meisele, A Ziegele, A Weisele, Dos Angele, Bist du, A Ziegele, A Weisele, Dos Angele, Bist du, A Mila, Mila, Milchele, und fliegen vier Juju. Yeah, Milchele, nicht Milchele, das ist doch bloß a Meisele, a Ziegele, a Meisele, das Milchele bist du. A Ziegele, a Weisele, das Milchele bist du. A Wolken du, A regen du, o mach die Augen zu. Nicht wolken du, nicht regen du, nicht sangele, nicht milchele, nicht ziegele, nicht weißele, mein Mädele bist du. Nicht ziegele, nicht weißele, mein Jingele bist du. Oh, that was magnificent. That was beautiful. Gorgeous. The thing about Yiddish music is that it's not like Western music and its ornamentation where, for example, if you're playing a violin mm -hmm. and you play with vibrato all the time, and if you're a singer, you sing with vibrato all the time, whereas in Yiddish, a vibrato is more of an ornamentation. You have a, a krex, a dreidel, a, a kvetch, a knetch, whatever you're singing with. It's the ornament, but you can't sing with ornaments all the time. You have to know when an ornament's needed. And that's part of, of understanding what is Yiddish music. It's not just what are the notes. It's where you don't sing what you don't sing, and where you're supposed to put what you do. So let's talk more about the art of Yiddish song and singing. Um, so you started describing some of the differences about what, you know, like the use of, of ornamentation. Uh, but fundamentally, do you think Yiddish songs are different from other varieties of songs? Or do you think that they're much like other types of folk songs? Wow. Um, perhaps I'm biased and chauvinistic. I would like to believe that Yiddish songs are different, but of course there's a relation to wherever one lived. Necessarily the music is going to sound a bit like one's host, one's neighbor. And uh, I'm working on a whole show based on, based on that concept, as a matter of fact. But, um, there's truth to the humorous statement that when a Jew sings a happy song, it sounds sad. And if you sing a sad song, it's going to sound a little bit happy. Whereas uh, a minor key, the rest of the Western world might consider that to be a sad key. But for us, it's our life, key. D minor is the key of life. <laughs> D, so. Uh, I, who was it? The, uh, one of the, um, oh, what's the name of that? Klezmer groups or something. Oh, well. Anyway, a, a famous Klezmer said, for you, D minor is just a key. For me, it's a living. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's really, it's true. And this, the songs that are in a minor key, and they can be really happy. And, and yeah, I think that is a little bit different from, from the surrounding host communities. But there was a lot of sharing that was going on because in a, I mean, a folk song, okay, that's, that's different from a klezmer. And the folk songs were mostly sung by women, as far as I know, and probably made up a lot. And no, there are different categories that were sung by men and made up by uh, Heider boys. And, but if you're talking about a love song, uh, definitely those are made up by women. 
and you would sing a song mostly a cappella, whereas now we have a whole group of musicians, which I enjoy. But it was something that was done in the home. And you would just sing a song. You'd maybe make up a song while you were working, something to sing to your child. Everybody wrote some, uh, some, every song was written by somebody. We just don't know who they were. I wish we did. We don't. So, is a Yiddish song different from other songs? I think so. There's some similarities to other cultures. What makes it different? I think I'm not as knowledgeable about the other culture's songs as I'd like to be in, in order to answer that question. If Walt were here, my musical partner, Walt Mahovlich, he knows everything about every other Eastern European culture's music. It's astonishing. He'd be able to tell you. Come, come to Cleveland. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but when I started listening to this music and getting into the less common music, learning more about it, learning the language, I felt like that old story where they say before you're born, an angel takes you around and shows you everything that there is to know in the world and the universe. But so that you shouldn't come out of the womb already knowing everything, the angel goes to you, shh, and that's where you get this mark. And sometimes they slip and you get a cleft chin. <laughs> This is what I was told. So when I learned Yiddish, that's what I felt like. I felt like I was remembering something that I had already learned. Not like it was something brand new. When I heard the songs, it was not foreign to me. It was something that spoke to me in a very deep way. Something that felt right. It felt natural. It felt home to me. It felt like my mishpoch. And that's why I'm so passionate about it, because it's, it fits, it feels right. And I know that other people would feel the same way, if they knew. I want them to know it. So a question, um, sort of a musical question, if you can. Can you compare from an artistic standpoint, the difference, for instance, for you between, let's say, a nigum, a Hebrew song, and a Yiddish folk song. I mean, for those who don't really know very much but from the artistic side, I mean, how different are these things or how interrelated are they? Well, Yiddish songs are based on the, the notes in the scales are, or the modes, I should say, are based on the traditional prayer modes, the notes that are in a particular prayer. And they're called by the names of those prayers. And so if you say, Adonai Malach to somebody, they're going to know, I hope I remember that right, uh, what group of notes we're going to play and sometimes it's a different series in an ascending line than a descending line. And um, it's more than just major and minor, it's all, all the other modes, but the Jewish modes, if you study the Western modes, maybe the Jewish mode might start on the second scale of that particular mode, so the order is not going to be the same. Well, you know, it's, it feels different when that happens. So, if you're talking about a Hebrew song, if it's a modern Israeli, uh, I mean, since the time of statehood or something, no. That's not going to be the same because that was something that was sort of artificially created, just like the dances, the choreography, uh, as opposed to something that occurred naturally within a culture. And, um, I mean, even so much so that in, in Yiddish dances, you went around to the, to the left, it was clockwise. So when they started doing the Israeli dances, they said, no, we're going to go counterclockwise. 
just so it's not associated with the old world dances. So there's definitely a rift there. There are some borrowings because, I mean, if you're creating something new, you can't create it out of thin air. It's got to come from somewhere. It's got to come from your experience. Just like when they were creating the, uh, the modern Israeli language, and, and every Israeli says, Manishmat, they don't know it's a calc, a direct translation of the Yiddish, was Herzif, right? They just say it. But what did the people who created Hebrew know? They spoke Yiddish. So they took the language, they created this language, but they put it on the framework of what they knew. So that's a whole other discussion. What is Hebrew? What is modern Hebrew? What is Israeli? Is it really Yiddish but with a different lexicon? Maybe. So it's the same thing with the music and the dance. That it's based on what they knew, just forced into a different mold. A name, a wordless song, that has the same, the same feeling as, as the folk songs. It's just, it comes from a different part of the culture, but it's definitely loved and used by, by all of us who enjoy Yiddish music and klezmer music. Does that answer your question? It absolutely does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I would love to hear at, at least a snippet of, let me hear something you're saying in a minor key that, so traditionally you think of minor as being sad, but for us it can be very happy. Give an example of a really happy tune in a minor key. Wow. Okay, like the one we just sang for, for official, Mikabel uh, Pondum sign, right? Whoever I you say, plong the almoni, me cabal pon him sign, plong the almoni, me cabal pon him sign. Long mural and name him, long mural and name him, drink in a glaze of levine. Long mural and name him, long mural and name him, drink in a glaze of levine. I put too many notes. <laughs> <laughs> But there, you're, uh, you're welcoming, you're congratulating somebody, and does it sound like a real happy thing? No, but it is. It's, you're expressing great joy. Nice. There's, there's great example. Yeah. So what's the oldest Yiddish folk song that you know? Well, the oldest Yiddish song that I know is from a book from, I think, it, 1726 or 1727, and it was the first book of Yiddish songs that was published with notes. However, they were written by this guy, and I'll have to look it up to tell you what his name was. I can't think of it offhand. And Simchat Hanef Hanefesh, is that the name of the book? And something like that. And his name was... Okay. But he wrote all these songs. It's the, the Hanukkah one that I was telling you. Uh huh. That guy. Um, some really weird. Oh, the poor melody is weird. It sounds like somebody's dancing around. Shika. It's really funny. Uh, but the oldest folk song, something that's not attri attributable, it could be Shikta Ha, which is a Pesach song that's kind of like Hadgadya. And it says. Uh, the, the, the lord of the, the farm, the area, uh, sends a, his poor farmer to pick the pears, but the pears won't fall. So the stick comes and hits the, hits the pears, but the pears won't fall. And the fire comes and burns the stick. And the stick hits the pears, but the pears won't fall. And they go on to the Malchamovis, and, and then uh, the Aha Kunt, the, the Lord of the area comes. And then finally, the, uh, you know, the Malchamovis strikes down the, the Shoichid and the ox, and the same thing, and drinks the water, and the, 
and that uh, puts out the fire and the stick hits the pears and the pears fall down. But as far as I know, that's... How old is that? Five, it could be 500 years old. Wow. Um, shikta, there's a, a number of different melodies, but one is Shikta hara poyun valda poyun vald, a vilde baril chrysen, a vilde baril chrysen. Um, poyro vilden, a baril chrysen, baril vil ni fallen, baril vil ni fallen. And so it's an additive song mm -hmm. like that. And it's, it's fun. And a lot of families still sing that. That's beautiful. So, question. Um, Frumkeit. Are you, are you from in any way, shape, or form? Or how does that relate or not? Well, deep in my heart, I would like to be a lot more observant than I am. But my family are going, <laughs> and it's impossible. It's just impossible. So, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have my home be more kosher than it is. And I, you know, I have my separate sets of dishes and everything, and and they mix everything up all the time, and they don't care. It makes me want to cry. But uh, don't watch this. <laughs> um, from, I don't know, I'm sure that if I were living in another place in another time, I would be. But I'm not, I'm living in, the, in America, so, you know, it's a, it's a mixed bag. I'm the director of the Cleveland Abateling, you know, and, but, you know, belonging to a conservative shul, growing up in Philadelphia in a conservative shul, which is which was more like or modern orthodox is now, you know, and, and my family always made it so much fun to be Jewish and to observe Jewish holidays, and I love that, and I wish I could impart that more to my, my son who, well, maybe as, well, maybe as he grows up, it'll come back to him, mm -hmm. and, and he'll become more observant, like I have. You said something just now that really interests me. You said that your family made it fun to be observant. Other than Yom how, how, what did they? what was that like? What did they do? What was fun? Well, my dad made everything fun. And his family, you know, that's where he came from. And it was just all, just all fun, just the way everybody talked and, and, um, our family, one of the highest aspirations, uh, one of the things that if you can attain in life that is most admired, is constantly making the worst puns in the world. So, we're constantly trying to outdo each other in making the biggest groaners. <laughs> Somebody says something, you have to find a rejoiner, rejoinder. And so just living like that was fun, but it's also, it expands your mind, you know, it forces you to think in odd tangents all the time to try and find something funny. So I do this all the time and people look at me odd. They don't get it. It's, I guess it's my family thing. I think it's a very Jewish thing. But some families do it and some families don't. But I think if you're forced to, to think in those ways, I think it makes you smarter. Because it forces you to think in ways that you otherwise would not think. And that, um, biologically speaking, physically speaking, chemically speaking, electrically speaking, in your body, creates more connections with your neurons, more neuronal pathways. And if you have more neuronal connections in your brain, you are more intelligent, you are smarter. So maybe that's one reason the Jews are smarter people, because we, we uh, are funny. What do you think of that as a theory? Uh. <laughs> So, so tell me, so on one hand, you've got some, rel some religious backgrounds and some religious bents. On the other hand, you just said that you're president of the Abdoing, which is very secular, tends to be, I mean, it tends to be apikorsum. 
Is there a conflict in those two aspects of your life for you? Slightly. When I was teaching for the Abba doing, and uh, I would write the plays, as I mentioned before, uh, for, what was it, Toby Schwad, I wrote a play about Honey, the circle maker, and the carob tree that you plant for your grandchildren, you went to sleep. It's like the Jewish Rumpelstiltskin story, you know? And because the story has something to do with God, so I mentioned God, and uh, we had some of the children of the Jewish Secular Society, and the parents were all up in arms because the children performed a play where God was mentioned. So, yeah, I suppose there's a conflict, but they separated from us shortly after that. I hope it wasn't my fault. But, but um, this, this is not really a problem. I found, honestly, that a lot of the children of the, the parents for the secular society, they believed in God, but they didn't tell the parents. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, it is. But... Our Cleveland Abba doing, people pretty much believe the way they want to believe, and our focus is less secularism than social action and Yiddish. So that's how I really come to it. That's why I love it. It's because it's the only organization that is working to preserve Yiddish in, in a less than from world. And since Yiddish has become so important to me, that's where I am. That's where it's home. That's where I have to be. That's great. Well, we're close to the end of the tape. Is there anything else you'd like to do or say? <sighs> Learn Yiddish. Teach Yiddish. Teach yourself Yiddish. Teach someone else Yiddish. Have a conversation with someone Yiddish. Learn a Yiddish song. Try to write a Yiddish poem. Go out somewhere and do a Yiddish dance. Do something Yiddish. 